policeman attacked by a flying humanoid entity. It was very early in the morning 3.15 a.m. on Friday, January 16, 2004 when police officer Leonardo Samaniego from Guadalupe, NL Mexico was doing his daily vigilance routine in his patrol car around Colonia Baez de la Sheila not knowing the shocking experience that he was about to live, a true drama that he will never forget. The night was cold and dark and the streets were empty when Samaniego made a turn onto Alamo Street and immediately noticed something very unusual. A huge, black object fell from a tree beside the street but it stopped just before touching the ground, and then slowly landed and turned itself to face the patrol car. At that moment, Officer Samaniego knew that something was wrong. So he turned on the high beams of his car to try to see what was this black object that fell from the tree was. That's when Samaniego's nightmare began. It was a woman, all dressed in black that fell from the tree but she didn't touch the ground, just remained floating several feet from the ground, declared Officer Leonardo Samaniego. I saw her very well and then she landed softly on the ground and stood there looking at me. She was trying to cover her face from the lights of the car, I think they were bothering her. I could see two big black eyes on her, completely black without eyelids, and her skin was dark brown. She was all dressed in black with cloak and cape like a witch and she seemed very upset by the lights. In a matter of seconds, the scene turned into a terrific sequence of events almost like a horror movie, but all too real. The being jumped very fast over too and onto, Samaniego's patrol car trying to get at him while the shocked police officer tried to run away in reverse while shouting desperately for backup assistance on his radio. Stunned Officer's Eyewitness Description Here is Officer Samaniego's testimonial of these terrifying seconds that for him must have seemed like a never-ending nightmare. As soon as I realized it was a kind of woman being, or a witch, very strange standing there trying to cover her face. She threw herself against my car very fast, falling on the car and hitting the windshield. She was flying very fast and it took only a second to hit the windshield glass. I was so shocked by this action that I put the car in reverse and pushed the accelerator trying to get away while requesting backup assistance by radio. According to Officer Samaniego's statement, the female being was trying to grab him with her hands right through the car's windshield. She was separated from the officer by only the few centimeters of the car's windshield. It was at this moment that Officer Samaniego got his best visual look at the being he described as a witch. It was a woman with big black eyes, everything was black, no eyelids. Her skin was dark brown and her expression was horrible. She was furiously trying to get me with her claws while I was running away in reverse calling desperately for backup assistance to any units around. When I finally hit the end of the street, I was so shocked that I covered my eyes and then I fainted. Officer Leonardo Samaniego lost consciousness after he covered his eyes trying not to see the frightening being still glued to the windshield trying to get to him. The severe amount of high stress experienced by him caused him to pass out. Some minutes later, two police units arrived as well as an ambulance that was nearby. When they got to the patrol car they found Officer Samaniego unconscious. Fortunately, he was not injured, perhaps due to the fact that he never abandoned the car during the incident. That decision may have prevented a tragedy. After several minutes, he regained consciousness and was attended by the paramedics on the ambulance. A TV camera crew that arrived with a police unit recorded Officer Samaniego's first interview just minutes after he felt calmed enough during the interrogation by his police colleagues. All this occurred at the same place of the bizarre incident. Officer Samaniego stood firmly on his account, insisting that the being was a witch that could fly and attacked him in his patrol car. On an evening in late August, 2017, a police officer riding down a road in a wooded location in a southwestern section of Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania saw something that startled him. Ahead of him on the side of the road, the officer observed what appeared to be a ball of very dull white light low to the ground. 
He was familiar with the area and had never noticed any type of lighting in that location. As he moved closer and was about 50 yards from the round light, it suddenly rose up or stood up from the ground. It was then that the witness observed something that he couldn't process. The officer told me, it was the weirdest thing I have ever seen. The ball of light was actually the head of a very strange being that looked to be about six feet tall or larger. It was tall and almost skeleton thin. The officer was of the opinion that the creature when he first observed it, had been lying on its belly on the ground with its head facing toward the road. It then stood up facing the road. In that dark location, he saw the dull light from the glowing head illuminating the upper section of the body of the creature. While the officer watched, the creature turned toward the right. The dull illumination from the head lit up the shoulder area. The creature then turned and faced him, then turned to the left and took off at an incredible speed away towards a location away from the road. As it moved off, the witness could see its arm swinging. The officer indicated that it took off at a speed that you could only call abnormal. It was faster than anything I have ever seen. It was there, then it was gone. The witness assumed that the creature moved on two legs, however, he could not see the lower sections of the body in the dark. The witness described what he saw as standing six feet or taller. The head was about eight to ten inches in diameter and shaped like a ball. He said the head was just a ball of light, possibly egg-shaped but pretty round. The light emitted seemed to be just a dull white. The light illuminated the shoulders, the top of the chest and a section of the arms. The witness could not see the hands. The chest looked to be about 18 inches across. The waist appeared to be small, but the arms were abnormally long. The long limbs also looked skeletal with no muscle mass. The skin tone of the body appeared to be dull grayish blue. The witness could not see any facial features. The entire experience only lasted about 10 seconds. The officer was confused as to what he saw and about what could move so fast. He pulled up his vehicle to the location where the creature had been standing and turned on his vehicle spotlight. He looked around the area but saw no evidence on the ground. The officer, after the experience, continued to try to make sense out of what he had encountered but he could not figure it out. I was contacted soon after the incident and we later discussed the incident in detail. In the fall of 2003, a Toronto police officer had a very strange encounter while off-duty moose hunting near the small town of Search Mount, Ontario, Canada. In October of 2003, the witness was with his brother-in-law, and they had just finished putting out moose bait and issuing moose calls to draw their prey in at around 8 a.m., and one of the animals did make an appearance, but displayed atypical behavior, as if spooked by something. Indeed, the large bull moose ran off in apparent fear. He called in his brother and they went about seeing if they could track the animal or draw it back in. The witness sprayed some moose in heat urine around to lure the animal back and sat back waiting for something to happen. At around 1.30 p.m., something certainly did happen, but this time it was no moose. The witness says, at about 1.30 p.m. I started hearing heavy thumps behind me every now and then. Every time I heard one, I would turn around but there was nothing there. I should mention that it was still raining. The sound of the rain hitting the ground or the leaves was quite loud but these thumps were much louder. They sounded like a stone or something heavy hitting the ground, but every time I turned around, I saw nothing. At about 5.25 pm I got off the ATV to stretch my legs and have a smoke. I put my gun on the front bag of the ATV to make sure I had it within reach and stood in front of the ATV facing the gully which was to my rear prior to this. While I was having my smoke I started hearing the distinctive sounds of footsteps coming from the gully, snapping branches and leaves crunching. I kept my eyes on the gully while I reached for my rifle. I thought the bull was coming back. When I looked into the gully about 40 yards straight in front of me I saw what I thought was a man walking towards me. He was stooped over and looked like he was having trouble walking in the bush. 
He grabbed a tree and swung himself around and ducked or dove down behind some thick brush. The total time of this took three to five seconds and he disappeared. He looked to me as if he was dressed all in black with a black toque or a balaclava on his head. The reason I though he was wearing a toque was his head seemed to be long at the back like a man wearing a toque. It looked like it was wearing a jacket and the front of his jacket was open halfway and I could see a different color of lining showing around the neck area. It looked like it was light gray or almost blue on the chest area in the shape of a V. I couldn't really say how tall it was because his legs were behind thick brush and I could only see to about mid thigh. But I would have guessed at the time that he was anywhere from 5 apostrophe 8 to 6 tall. But he was about 40 yards away and it's hard to judge height or size in the bush when you're not sure of the distance. His arms seemed too long for a man but he was extremely muscular, like a bodybuilder with the typical V-shaped build. There was definitely no fat on him at all. I could see the different muscle groups on his upper body and arms bulging out and could see that it had a washboard stomach. When he grabbed the tree I saw that he had hands, not paws. He swung around the tree and dove for cover as if trying to hide from me. As I said earlier, it was a dull day and was raining and he looked wet. He was covered with black or dark brown hair and it looked like the hair was stuck to him fairly closely because he was wet. What also gave me the bodybuilder impression was that he seemed to have no neck, or he had so much muscle on his shoulders that it gave that appearance. On top of all this his shoulders were extremely broad. The witness watched this strange figure for a time and also noticed that whatever it was was making a raspy, coughing sound as it moved, and that it began issuing a long, hoarse, sad-sounding howl before disappearing into the wilderness. It was this howl that really got him to thinking that he was experiencing something very bizarre, and he says. When I first saw it, I thought it was a man maybe lost in the bush. But my first thought was why isn't he wearing any orange and if he's lost, why doesn't he just ask for help? But the howl made me realize quickly that this was no man. The next thing going through my head was what the hell was that? That was no moose. It was definitely not a wolf or a bear. It was like nothing I had ever seen in 35 years of hunting. What it looked like to me was a gorilla or very close to one, but it walked upright, not on all fours. I stood there motionless for almost an hour and a half waiting to see if it would show itself again. After a while it started to dawn on me that I may have just seen a Bigfoot and I started to get just a little scared. I normally leave the bush after dark when hunting but this night I left about a half hour prior to make sure I had lots of time. I was going to go back to that area the next day looking for that bull but I couldn't bring myself to go anywhere near that spot. That's the first time in 35 years I have ever been afraid in the bush. Since then I have wondered if this thing I saw is what scared the bull away. Like I said earlier, I have seen many moose in the bush and have never seen one run from me like that. Interestingly though, from where the bull ran off to where I saw this creature was only about 50 yards. Another thing, I don't know if this means anything or not, where I was sitting I saw a large, probably moose leg bone laying on the ground about 5 feet from my ATV. It wasn't cut or sawed, it had been broken or snapped. It looked to be about at least a year old. I was supposed to sit there for the next three days to finish the hunt off and wait for that bull, and I didn't want to be there. I've never been that scared in the bush in my life. As a cop I spend a lot of time dealing with things that scare people. Things they can't or don't want to try and explain. I'm usually the person that gets the call to go check out the things that go bump in the night. Add in the fact I usually work alone. In the middle of nowhere. I've ran across and seen some things I can't rightly explain. This was probably the first time in my career I had been in a supernatural situation. It had happened before in life but cop-wise this was the starting point of what has turned out to be a very interesting career. One night, on the tail end of July, I was cruising back county roads trying to find some kind of trouble to get into. As the only deputy out in the county that night I had been busy up to a point. Then the calls had slacked off around midnight. 
I hadn't seen a single soul for the last few hours and decided I would try and be proactive for a bit. The night was hot, I had the window rolled down. I had been driving for a few hours straight with no luck at finding anything. The only thing I had scared up was a few rabbits and a fox. I decided to stop, stretch my legs and answer nature's calling. I pulled to a stop in a particularly empty part of the county. I had driven the road a few times. It was mostly old, abandoned farmhouses and barns. No one lived in the area, and it made a good target for thieves trying to steal copper or whatever they could get their hands on. The left side of the road was nothing but cornfields as far as you could see. It was getting close to harvest time. The stalks were close to seven or eight feet tall and just a sea of green. On the right side of the truck was an old, abandoned apple orchard. I never did get the full story of how the land came to be abandoned. It had something to do with multiple mistresses, multiple wills, illegitimate children and other nonsense. The result of which was 150 acres of fruit trees that had become its own little forest over the 20 or so years that had been unattended. I was sitting in the truck, head laid back, just enjoying my little break. I had closed my eyes for a second. When I opened them, I looked out into the cornfield and made direct eye contact with, something. At first, I thought it was a person and it almost gave me a heart attack right there. The thing stood about seven feet tall. Its eyes were human, but they shone in the night like animal eyes. I'm not a weak man. I've done more stupid and foolish things in my time than I care to remember. I've been afraid before and I'm not above admitting it. There was something about those eyes that absolutely terrified me though. So, I did what any normal insane 22-year-old dumb kid would do, and I chased it. I kept eye contact with the thing. I slowly rolled up my window and without breaking. I checked out with dispatch over the radio and grabbed my patrol rifle off its mount above me. I remember taking a deep breath and then throwing the door open and jumping out of the truck yelling sheriff's office in the most authoritative voice I could muster. I maintained eye contact for the entire time except right as my vision crossed the A pillar on the driver's side. As soon as my boots touched the dirt of the road the creature was gone. I caught nothing but a blur as a black and brown shape vaulted across the road and ran into the trees. Once again, I let my sense of self-invincibility get the better of me. I kicked the door closed on the truck and took off after it yelling for it to stop. I stumbled into the forest and was hit with the most overpowering odor. It was a combination of unwashed person, body odor, and animal musk. I still remember the smell vividly all these years later. I've been around rotting bodies that didn't impact me as much as that smell. I've never been a particularly fast runner. I've not ever cared much for it and always been more of a short burst kind of guy. Whatever I was going after was fast though. It didn't dawn on me until much later that it was probably just playing with me leading me further into its miniature forest. I would catch a black blur moving off the in the distance. I'd hear a branch break or a sound off to the side. I stumbled around like this for a good 15 minutes before my bravado and adrenaline wore off and I decided I should head back to the truck because I was alone and scared at this point. The whole way back I had that itch between my shoulder blades like I was being watched. Like I was the intruder in someone else's domain. I made it out of the trees and back to the truck. It was in the same place I had left it, but the driver's side door was open, the dome light on, vehicle turned off with the key still in the ignition. I knew I hadn't locked the door, but I know it had left it running. I didn't often turn it off during my shift. I checked the truck making sure it was empty. That same smell filled the cab of the truck. It was in the seats and carpets like something had sat in my seat and just wallowed around in it. I started the truck and got out of there as fast as I could. I didn't tell anyone about that encounter. I just told dispatch I had thought I had seen something, that it turned out to be nothing and left it at that. Around a year later during one of the few times I rotated to days and had a partner to work with. I was driving around on the opposite side of the county. I had just cleared a cattle call, 
playing cowboy pushing some steers back into a fence when my partner called me wanting to know where I was. He was scared and I could hear it in his voice. I let him know where I was, and he asked if I could meet him down on the southwest part of the county. There was an old gin down there. It just happened to be in the same general area of my encounter about a year prior. I had never told him about it, but I agreed to meet him. The story I got from him was he had pulled into the same cornfield from a year earlier, not too far from where my story took place. He had backed into it down a turn row that was used to maintain the pivot. He decided to stop there to get a few minutes of rest. It was a Sunday morning, like most of our Sundays nothing would really happen until after lunch when people started to get active. My partner had dosed off for a few minutes and had been woken by his truck violently being shook back and forth with a dust cloud dissipating around him. He first thought it was me just messing with him. When he got out to check he told me he smelled a nasty animal odor. Not finding anything else out of the ordinary he went to get back in his truck and drove away. He drove down to the gin, got out and walked around the place to make sure no one was there. When he went to go get back in the truck he noticed the handprint on top of his window. Now anyone who has ever driven a truck down a dirt road will tell you handprints on vehicles fill with dust and stand out. He saw the print, freaked out and called me. Right over his head on the top part of the door and the cab of the truck was the biggest handprint I've ever seen in my life. I have average hands for my size. It was easily bigger than two of my hands. I told him my story, he described the smell nearly the same as I did. Neither of us ever found out what was living down there. I heard a few more stories over my time there. I even ran across one guy who was convinced it was the West Texas version of Bigfoot. I would answer a few suspicious person's calls around the area over the next few years. I always kept an eye out but never had another encounter like I did that night though. A very well-known Bigfoot report by a police officer that made a lot of waves in its time occurred in August of 1976, in the rural area of Whitehall, New York. On this day, Officer Brian Goslin was driving on the outskirts of town along a lonely stretch called Abear Road when he saw a massive hairy man-like creature with red eyes lumber out of the woods about 30 feet in front of him. Goslin would describe it as standing 7 or 8 feet tall and weighing at least 400 pounds, and he was so alarmed by what he was seeing that he reportedly got out of his patrol car to train his spotlight and firearm on it, yet found himself unable to shoot. The strange beast, caught in the beam of the spotlight, then issued an unearthly shriek before barreling off into the trees, leaving behind giant footprints in a nearby field. Over the next few days, other officers would also apparently see the creature, and even Goslin's father and brother would see it. Goslin would eventually write of his surreal experience in his 2018 book, Bear Wrote the True Story. This would not be the end of the strangeness in Whitehall, because in February of 1982 another police officer in the area by the name of Dan Gordon and his partner had their own encounter. The two had been on duty patrolling along on Route 22 half a mile from East Bay at the base of Lake Champlain, when an eight-foot-tall ape-like creature ran across the road to go and climb right up a steep embankment to disappear into the brush. The creature was described as being a little different from a typical Bigfoot, in that it was long, lanky, and had narrow shoulders rather than bulging with muscles, and further details were that it slouched heavily, that had extremely long, thin gangly arms, and that it was remarkably fast and agile beyond any human. Gordon allegedly got out of the car to try and pursue the creature as the other officer sat frozen and terrified in the car, but the beast was already long gone. The two would keep their experience to themselves for years, only going public with it in 2003, after which Gordon was interviewed about it extensively in news stories and TV programs, including Monster Quest and Mysterious Encounters, and the report appeared in the book Bigfoot Encounters in New York and New England. Gordon was described as an incredibly honest and trustworthy man, and insisted on the veracity of what he saw right up to his death in 2014.
from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, archives comes a report from 1970, in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana. In spring of that year, two police officers were called out to a home in the town of Marrero at approximately 9 p.m. on a report of a prowler from a terrified homeowner. The officers arrived at the scene and questioned the female homeowner, and then did a perimeter sweep of the area, even calling in a K-9 unit. As soon as the dog arrived, it apparently went absolutely nuts, very agitated and seemingly scared of something and cowering. The officers circled around the darkened house with guns drawn, now convinced that there was a trespasser lurking about the property, but what they saw was beyond anything either one of them had expected. As they rounded the edge of the house, they apparently came to a dark form huddled against the side of the building as if hiding, but it was hulking in size, and when it moved they could see it was not human in its massive proportions. The creature was reported by the officers as being at least 8 feet in height, very wide, and taking long strides out to the street, where it passed under a streetlight and they could see that it was covered in dark brown hair. They apparently got a very good look at it in the light, after which it bolted towards a wooded marshy area near a canal, and vanished. When interviewed by the BFRO investigator the witness would say, the incident with the entity was officially reported in the record system of that jurisdiction. I remember that we did not emphasize the subject beyond describing it as very tall, and dark in color, with no specific description of any clothing, etc. because it wasn't wearing any clothes, and as I told you, in those days I had no idea what I was looking at. Our superiors knew from us verbally what we had seen. And then it was dropped. We handled many unexplainable incidents, as do police agencies now. The public just never hears about them. This is what I mentioned to you, about me going back seven years later and not finding the reports. My partner died when he was just 37 years old, so we never had any chance to speak about anything again before he checked out. He was a quiet, no-nonsense guy who wasn't comfortable talking about a lot of the incidents we handled including other unexplainable incidents. I am a police officer. I was traveling northbound on FM 1008 and there was an 18-wheel truck in front of me at the time and we were traveling at approximately 55 miles per hour. I observed a large creature in an upright position run out of the tree line on the east side of the highway. It ran in front of the big truck in front of me. The truck braked and swerved to the east side of the road and the creature was unharmed and cleared the road and ran into the tree line on the west side of FM 1008. From what I could see this creature appeared to be as tall as the cab of the 18-wheeler, maybe 8 feet and was very bulky and covered in hair. I estimated the speed at which it was running to be around 35 miles per hour with extremely long strides. There are other police and fire services members in the Kennefic area that have seen this creature, and I have personally heard numerous stories of sightings. If I had not seen firsthand, I would not have believed it myself. Investigator Daryl Coiler would do an in depth follow up interview on the case with the witness and uncover some further details, of which he says, it was the witness's perception that the figure was tall and covered with grayish hair. The witness was certain that the figure was a biped and moved extremely fast, perhaps 30 to 35 miles per hour. The witness could not recall much in the way of detail, the event was estimated to have lasted only a few short seconds. The witness was impressed by the height of the figure. Using the cab of the 18-wheeler as a gauge, the witness estimated the subject's height to be possibly as much as 8 feet. Because of the figure's speed, overall size and height, and the fact that the subject nearly collided with the 18-wheeler, the witness categorically ruled out the possibility of a hoax. In retrospect, the witness wishes that he had slowed down or even stopped to get a second or better look. He also wishes that he had flagged the big rig down somehow to get the truck driver's perspective. However, the witness told me that what he saw greatly intimidated him, and at the time, he had absolutely no plans for stopping. He carried a .45 semi-auto handgun with him, 
but the sidearm gave him little or no security after having witnessed such an incident. Hello, my name is James Twiss. I am a police officer on the Pine Ridge Reservation. I am passing on information regarding the rash of sightings of a tall man or Bigfoot on the Pine Ridge Reservation. During one of these sightings, I had our department's thermal imaging camera and along with about six other officers, did in fact pick up a large heat signature on the camera. Unfortunately, we don't have a recorder yet for the camera so we weren't able to record it. We did watch as it moved away from us down a gully and it was missed by the other officers as they tried to find it using their flashlights. It is hard to explain as it must have already been past the officers before they arrived on scene. We watched it go into the creek area which runs through town. We heard a flurry of dogs barking but wasn't able to locate it. Also to set the record straight, the first two sightings was called in as a tall, 10 to 15 feet tall man, who appeared to be wearing a stovepipe hat and long coat. It was reported to be peeking into a apartment complex commons room where there were several witnesses. A police officer in McDade Park in Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, said he was out on patrol when he noticed a looming dark shape leaning over the roadway with a large hairy section including a big hairy wrist and an extremely muscular leg. The officer, who claims he is an 18-year veteran of the force, says of his outlandish encounter, I was driving in patrol toward McDade Park in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It was late at night I was just checking the park making sure all was okay and I just noticed a very dark object leaning over the edge of the road near the pool as I drove past. I passed extremely close to the object close enough for me to feel shocked to see a large hairy section of well-muscled leg and a big hairy wrist and hand as the creature turned I screamed and grabbed my cell to snap a pick and my gun. I slammed on the brakes and I was ready to shoot. I'm combat trained, I have a weapon. I just had to see what the hell it was. I wanted to see the entire thing for myself, but what can I say? Whatever it was for me either was a monkey a huge one or a Bigfoot I am not going public with this because it would cost me my job. There is something in that park I heard stories of something roaming the park late at night. The ball of light was actually the head of a very strange being that looked to be about six feet tall or larger. It was tall and almost skeleton thin. The officer was of the opinion that the creature when he first observed it, had been lying on its belly on the ground with its head facing toward the road. It then stood up facing the road. In that dark location, he saw the dull light from the glowing head illuminating the upper section of the body of the creature. While the officer watched, the creature turned toward the right. The dull illumination from the head lit up the shoulder area. The creature then turned and faced him, then turned to the left and took off at an incredible speed away towards a location away from the road. As it moved off, the witness could see its arm swinging. The officer indicated that it took off at a speed that you could only call abnormal. It was faster than anything I have ever seen. It was there then it was gone. The witness assumed that the creature moved on two legs, however, he could not see the lower sections of the body in the dark. The witness described what he saw as standing six feet or taller. The head was about eight to ten inches in diameter and shaped like a ball. He said the head was just a ball of light, possibly egg-shaped but pretty round. The light emitted seemed to be just a dull white. The light illuminated the shoulders, the top of the chest and a section of the arms. The witness could not see the hands. The chest looked to be about 18 inches across. The waist appeared to be small, but the arms were abnormally long. The long limbs also looked skeletal with no muscle mass. The skin tone of the body appeared to be dull grayish blue. The witness could not see any facial features. The entire experience only lasted about 10 seconds. The officer was confused as to what he saw and about what could move so fast. 
He pulled up his vehicle to the location where the creature had been standing and turned on his vehicle spotlight. He looked around the area but saw no evidence on the ground. The officer, after the experience, continued to try to make sense out of what he had encountered but he could not figure it out. I was contacted soon after the incident and we later discussed the incident in detail. A woman and three children who claimed to be possessed by demons. A nine-year-old boy walking backward up a wall in the presence of a family case manager and hospital nurse. Gary Police Captain Charles Austin said it was the strangest story he had ever heard. Austin, a 36-year veteran of the Gary Police Department, said he initially thought Indianapolis resident Latoya Amance and her family concocted an elaborate tale as a way to make money. But after several visits to their home and interviews with witnesses, Austin said simply, I am a believer. Not everyone involved with the family was inclined to believe its incredible story. And many readers will find Ammon's supernatural claims impossible to accept. But, whatever the cause of the creepy occurrences that befell the family, whether they were seized by a systematic delusion or demonic possession, it led to one of the most unusual cases ever handled by the Department of Child Services. Many of the events are detailed in nearly 800 pages of official records obtained by the Indianapolis Star and recounted in more than a dozen interviews with police, DCS personnel, psychologists, family members and a Catholic priest. Ammons, who swears by her story, has been unusually open. While she spoke on condition her children not be interviewed or named, she signed releases letting the star review medical, psychological and official records that are not open to the public, and not always flattering. Furthermore, the family's story is made only more bizarre because it involves a DCS intervention, a string of psychological evaluations, a police investigation and, ultimately, a series of exorcisms. It's a tale, they say, that started with flies. In November 2011, Ammons' family moved into a rental house on Carolina Street in Gary, a quiet lane lined with small one-story homes. Big black flies suddenly swarmed their screened-in porch in December, despite the winter chill. This is not normal, Ammons' mother, Rosa Campbell, remembers thinking. We killed them and killed them and killed them, but they kept coming back. There were other strange happenings, too. After midnight, Campbell and Ammons both said, they occasionally heard the steady clump of footsteps climbing the basement stairs and the creak of the door opening between the basement and kitchen. No one was there. Even after they locked the door, the noise continued. Campbell said she awoke one night and saw a shadowy figure of a man pacing her living room. She leapt out of bed to investigate, and found large, wet boot prints. On March 10, 2012, Campbell said, the family's unease turned to fear. 12-year-old levitates. It was about 2 a.m. normally, Campbell, Ammons and her children would have been asleep, but they were mourning the death of a loved one with a group of friends. Ammons, who was in Campbell's bedroom, startled everyone by screaming, Mama! Mama! Campbell said she ran into her bedroom, where her then 12-year-old granddaughter and a friend were staying. Ammons and Campbell said the 12-year-old was levitating above the bed, unconscious. According to their account of events, Ammons and several others surrounded the girl, praying. Campbell said she remembers being terrified. I thought, what's going on? Campbell said. Why is this happening? Eventually, Campbell said, her granddaughter descended onto the bed. The girl woke up with no memory of what happened, Campbell said. Campbell and Ammons said the people who were visiting that night refused to return. Campbell says she remembers telling her daughter, we need help. We need to talk to someone who knows how to deal with it. Campbell and Ammons said they didn't know exactly what it was, but they believed it was something supernatural. They called local churches, but most refused to listen. Eventually, after listening to Campbell and Ammons talk about the house and visiting it, Officials at one church told them the Carolina Street House had spirits in it. They recommended the family clean the home with bleach and ammonia, 
then use oil to draw crosses on every door and window. At the church's suggestion, Ammon said she poured olive oil on her three children's hands and feet, then smeared oil in the shape of crosses on their foreheads. Campbell and Ammons also told the star they reached out to two clairvoyants, who said the family's home was besieged by more than 200 demons. Their explanation made sense to Campbell and Ammons, they say, because it meshed with their Christian faith. The best thing you can do is move, Ammons remembers the clairvoyants telling her. But moving wasn't an option for the cash-strapped family. Instead, Ammons said she took a clairvoyant's advice and made an altar in the basement. Ammons covered an end table with a white sheet, then placed a white candle and statue of Mary, Joseph and Jesus on it. She opened a Bible to Psalm 91. She said she and another person donned white t-shirts and wound white scarves around their heads. Also on a clairvoyant's advice, they burned sage and sulfur throughout the house, starting upstairs and working their way down. The smoke was so thick they could hardly breathe. Ammons drew a cross with the smoke. The person she was with read Psalm 91 aloud as they moved through the house, you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday, Ammons said nothing odd happened for three days. Then, things got worse. The family said demons possessed Ammons and her children, then ages 7, 9 and 12. The kids' eyes bulged, evil smiles crossed their faces, and their voices deepened every time it happened, Campbell and Ammons said. Campbell said the demons didn't affect her because she was born with protection from evil. She said she, and others like her, have a guardian who protects them. Ammons said she felt weak, lightheaded and warm when she was possessed. Her body shook, and she said she felt out of control. You can tell it's different, something supernatural. The youngest boy, then seven, sat in a closet talking to a boy that no one else could see. The other boy was describing what it felt like to be killed. Campbell said the seven-year-old once flew out of the bathroom as if he'd been thrown, and a headboard once smacked into Ammon's daughter, causing a wound that needed stitches. The 12-year-old would later tell mental health professionals that she sometimes felt as if she were being choked and held down so she couldn't speak or move. She said she heard a voice say she'd never see her family again and wouldn't live another 20 minutes. Some nights were so bad the family slept at a hotel. Finally, in desperation, they went to their family physician, Dr. Jeffrey Anyukwu, on April 19, 2012. Ammon said she told him what they were going through, hoping he might understand. Anyukwu told the star it was bizarre. 20 years, and I've never heard anything like that in my life, he said. I was scared myself when I walked into the room, he said he would not speak in more detail unless Ammons had psychiatric clearance for the waiver of confidentiality she had signed. In his medical notes about the visit, Anyukwu wrote delusions of ghost in home and hallucinations. He also wrote history of ghost at home and delusional. What Ammons and Campbell say happened next also was detailed in a DCS report of a family case manager's interviews with medical staff. Chaos erupted. Campbell said Ammons' sons cursed on Yukwu in demonic voices, raging at him. Medical staff said the youngest boy was lifted and thrown into the wall with nobody touching him, according to a DCS report. The boys abruptly passed out and wouldn't come too, Campbell added. She cradled one boy in her arms, Ammons held the other. Someone from the doctor's office called 911. Anyukwu said seven or eight police officers and multiple ambulances showed up. Everybody was, they couldn't figure out exactly what was happening, he recalled. Police and emergency personnel took the boys to Methodist Hospital's campus in Gary. Ammons said hospital personnel laughed at her desire to anoint her sons in olive oil. I couldn't talk to them, she said, so I talked to God. The boys woke up in the hospital. The older boy, then nine, acted rationally, but the youngest screamed and thrashed, Campbell said. She said it took five men to hold him down. Meanwhile, 
someone called DCS and asked the agency to investigate Ammons for possible child abuse or neglect. The caller, who is not named in the DCS report, speculated that Ammons might have a mental illness. The person believed the children were performing for Ammons, and she was encouraging their behavior. DCS family case manager Valerie Washington was asked to handle the initial investigation. She gave the following account to police and in her intake officer's report, hospital personnel examined Ammons and her children and found them to be healthy and free of marks or bruises. A hospital psychiatrist evaluated Ammons and determined she was of sound mind. Washington interviewed the family in the hospital. While she spoke with Ammons, the seven-year-old boy started growling with his teeth showing. His eyes rolled back in his head. The boy locked his hands around his older brother's throat and refused to let go until adults pried his hands open. Later that evening, Washington and registered nurse Willie Lee Walker brought the two boys into a small exam room for an interview. Campbell joined them. The seven-year-old stared into his brother's eyes and began to growl again. It's time to die, the boy said in a deep, unnatural voice. I will kill you. While the youngest boy spoke, the older brother started head-butting Campbell in the stomach. Campbell grabbed her grandson's hands and started praying. What happened next would rattle the witnesses, and a summit would offer not only evidence but proof of paranormal activity. According to Washington's original DCS report, an account corroborated by Walker, the nurse, the nine-year-old had a weird grin and walked backward up a wall to the ceiling. He then flipped over Campbell, landing on his feet. He never let go of his grandmother's hand. He walked up the wall, flipped over her and stood there, Walker told the star. There's no way he could have done that. Later, police asked Washington whether the boy had run up the wall, as though performing an acrobatic trick. No, Washington told them. She said the boy glided backward on the floor, wall and ceiling, according to a police report. Washington did not respond to the star's request for comment. But she told police she was scared when it happened and ran out of the room. As for Walker, Washington said, he ran out of the room with me. We didn't know what was going on, Walker told the star. That was crazy. I was like, everybody gotta go. According to Washington's report, they told a doctor what happened. The doctor, who did not believe them, asked the boy to walk up the wall again. Walker said he told the doctor he doubted the boy could repeat the feat. This kid was not himself when he did that, Walker said. The boy said he didn't remember what happened and couldn't do it, according to Washington's report. Walker, who said he previously believed in demons and spirits, thought the boy's behavior had some demonic spirit to it but also was the result of a mental illness. A police report quoted Washington saying she believed there could be an evil influence affecting the family. To be continued. I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me on the night of June 29, 2017 in Chicago, Illinois. I am reporting this of my own volition and I am wanting to stay anonymous due to the fact that I work for the Chicago Police Department and do not want anybody else to know that I submitted this report. I have been with the Chicago Police Department for over eight and a half years. The only people who know that I submitted this are my wife my son who encouraged me to submit this and my partner who also was witness to this incident. I want you to know that I am of a sound mind and health and I don't want any publicity other than just reporting this incident. I also want you to know that I am not prone to fits of fantasy or hoaxing anything that I seen especially while I am on duty. On the night of June 29, 2017 at approximately 11.15 p.m. my partner and I were on routine patrol and approaching the intersection West 81st and South Throop in the Auburn-Gresham neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois. We were flagged down by a group of a people who were pointing up to the top of an apartment building that was on the corner. We pulled over and they immediately started telling us to look up at the building. Many of the people were very frightened and were very excited about seeing what they had seen. 
My partner and I look and see a large creature that was approximately six to six and a half feet tall and was very thin. If it had been a human, it would have been emaciated. This thing was standing on top of the building and had what looked like a pair of very large wings that extended out at least eight to 10 feet from tip to tip. No discernible features. It just looked like a dark black shadow with wings. My partner and I both thought it was somebody trying to jump from the building and maybe wearing a costume of some kind. When we both shined our flashlights to try to get a better look at what we were dealing with, this thing took off into the air and flew away. As this creature flew away, headed in a southern direction, something sounding like a scream came from it and within the matter of about 5 seconds this creature was gone into the night. The people who initially flagged us down had said that many people in the neighborhood had seen this thing for the previous two nights and this just happened to be the only time that it was seen in a stationary place. We stood there stunned as this thing flew away and disappeared into the night. We stood there and talked to the group of people who flagged us down, taking information down and any information regarding previous sightings from the nights before. We initially were doubtful about filing a report because we thought we would be made fun of for seeing little green men. We finally filed a report as we did not want to violate protocol. Nothing was ever said about the report being filed and as of right now it's been business as usual. We wanted to file this report because after I told my son the story he went online and showed me that this is not the only sighting of something similar being seen in the city. I showed my partner the day after the sighting and he said that he didn't want to be involved and as far as he was concerned it was nothing more than a large owl or big bird that was misidentified. My son was the one who encouraged me to file this and do it anonymously to protect my identity. I know what I saw was real and even though I have no explanation as to what it truly is I know that what I saw was flesh and blood. I am a Christian man who believes that there are things that come from other planes and stalk the people of this earth and that only one's faith is what protects us from these things. I know that my faith is strong and therefore I am protected and I hope that I never see this thing again. Thank you very much for your time and have a blessed day. I worked as a police officer in a small town in rural Nebraska. Back in the 90s, I was patrolling through town in the winter. We had several abandoned houses in town, but one seemed to have the attraction of copper thieves, so we were told to keep an eye on it. I drove by it around 7 p.m., and since it sat on a corner lot, I had a clear view of all four sides of the house. As I drove around the corner, Nothing looks out of the ordinary. About two hours later, I drive by again, and the back door is wide open. I know that the back door was not open when I drove by it earlier. Looking at the snow on the ground around the house, there were no footprints. So I thought what the hell? Call dispatch, tell them I'm investigating an open door at that address, and ask for a county sheriff to start my way. I walk to the open door, pull out my flashlight, and shine it inside. The house has obviously been gutted for the most part. The plaster walls have been torn down. Debris piles up everywhere. Since there were no footprints in the snow around the door other than mine, and with all the dust on the floor not showing any footprints, I chalked it up to the wind, or maybe the door just opened on its own. I was about to secure the door when I heard a loud thump come from upstairs and what sounded like kids laughing. So I entered the house and yelled out, Police department, come downstairs. More of what sounds like kids playing. I tell dispatch that it sounds like there are kids in the house and start making my way through the kitchen into the living room where the stairs are. All the while cautiously checking the main floor. I hear something upstairs two more times, but since I've had no response, I start thinking maybe it's an animal. Still, I hear what I'd swear was kids laughing. I head upstairs and it all gets quiet. The upstairs is relatively small, with a hallway at the top of the stairs that has one bedroom on the right, one straight ahead at the end of the hall, and one on the left. 
As I get to the top of the stairs, I hear a thump in the bedroom to my left. I carefully peek around the door and it's an empty room with a small pile of plaster and wood debris in the middle. No kidding, sitting on top of the pile of debris was a page torn out of a child's book with a picture of a police officer on it. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. I got out of that room, quickly cleared the other rooms upstairs and got the F out of there. Told dispatch nobody was in the house, locked the back door and never went back in there again. A local reporter named Bob D would always show up at any major police activity from the police scanner. Big car wrecks, fires, anything worth reporting in the local paper. Everybody on the force knew Bob D. He was around at least once or twice a week at various police activities. Bob was a bit of a joker himself. He would mess with people by flicking behind their ears. People would react to the flicks, thinking it was a bug, only to turn around and see it was Bob jerking around. Everybody liked Bob. Unfortunately, Bob had bad lung cancer and died pretty suddenly. His wife buried him, against his wishes, he wanted to be cremated, for the next couple of weeks, after his funeral, people kept talking about seeing Bob at car wrecks, fires, all the same stuff he used to report on. There were 20 to 30 reports like this from civilians and members of the force. My uncle didn't buy it. Until the night he and my aunt arrived at our door, gun drawn and as pale as paper. We asked him what the hell happened, and he had to sit down, take his breath, compose himself, and start to outline what happened. Note, this is a guy that I never saw get rattled by anything. He said, My aunt, and he were sitting on the couch in their house watching TV. My uncle kept scratching at his ear over and over. Finally, my aunt asked him what the problem was, and he turned around just in time to see their bedroom door open. Bob D was standing there in the doorway. Clear as day. My uncle jumped up, cussed or something, and got my aunt's attention, who turned to see him there too. As soon as they both made eye contact with him, Bob smiled, turned, walked across the living room and out their front door. He closed the door behind him and was gone. My uncle got control of himself and ran outside. Gunner went looking for Bob, but he was gone. At that point, they ran over to our place. We went over there and didn't see anything, but my aunt and uncle stayed at our place that night. At work the next day, all the guys on the force were giving my uncle lots of we told you so. People around town said they saw Bob D show up at police scenes for at least another two-thirds months. My dad saw him in our darkroom in our basement with a friend. He was flicking their ears in the dark. During the third month, people that saw him kept saying he was looking worse and worse. My uncle saw him two more times each time confirming that he was looking more and more worn. My dad had concluded that he was decomposing and his ghost was reflecting that process. Every time my ear itches, I get goosebumps. It's not my call, but my dad served for 25 years. One night, he gets a call from a woman who says her neighbor has made a pact with the devil. The woman calling is about 35 and a religious wacko. The neighbor called was about 75 at the time. My dad went over and knocked on the door, and the old lady answered, all happy, nice place decorated the same way for the past 50 years. She invites my dad in without even asking why he came, makes him some coffee, and asks how his day was. Naturally, at this point, my dad was wondering what the heck the call was about, but it came clear soon. At some point, my dad realizes he isn't the only person she is talking to, and that she thinks her apartment is full of people. My dad thanks her for the coffee, and she tells him to come back anytime. 
The whole time she was talking, he was writing down the names of the people she was talking to, and doing some research on her when he got back. It turns out she was talking to family members who were all dead. She had a daughter, three sons, a brother and a husband. All were dead, and she had no family or friends. She hadn't spoken to another person in years. Her groceries were delivered, and she rarely left her apartment. Over the next 19 years, my dad took care of her. My sister and I came over all the time and just sat and talked with her. She even taught me how to cook. Over the years, she stabilized and stopped talking to her deceased relatives. She just needed people to live with. She actually lived till she was 94 and died in the guest room of my parents' house since it had become harder to take care of her from a distance as she got closer to the end. She was like a grandma to us. My dad was a cop for 32 years. This was one of his craziest calls. A call goes out for reported screaming. It's mid-January, important later. My father and another office respond to find a known deranged individual, very long rap sheet and has been in and out of psychiatric care for years, sitting on the front porch holding a double-sided wood splitting axe. Steam is coming up off the grass and there are chunks lying all over the lawn. Upon interviewing the suspect, he admitted that he and a friend were playing poker. The suspect was losing nearly every hand and came to the conclusion that his friend was a haint, southern for ghost, and was cheating him. The suspect grabbed the axe and chased his friend outside and hacked him into dozens of pieces, thus causing the warm blood to create steam on the grass. My dad tells the suspect that he needs to get in the police car because it's haint proof. He said the suspect dropped the axe and sprinted to get in the back seat while thanking them for helping him. I'm a police officer. I was called to a residence out in the boonies. This was in Wyoming, so the boonies are really the boonies. At about 11 p.m. about suspicious activity. When we get there, we are told by the family living there that there are very strange screams coming from a creek area about 1,000 feet away. And sure enough, waiting outside on the porch with them for about a minute, I heard it. It is very hard to describe what it sounded like. It was like a woman in very severe distress, but higher pitched, and each scream lasted for about 15 seconds. It never sounded like it was saying anything, it just sounded like a cry of sheer terror. And it happened again. We tell the family we are going to investigate, so we just walked down to the creek since it was nice out. We hear about two more screams, getting louder as we approach the creek. By now, we're both kind of freaked out. There are two possibilities. Someone is getting murdered slash maimed in the creek bed, or it's a wild animal. As we approach the creek bed, we hear no screams for about five minutes. We search around and find nothing, yelling at the top of our lungs for somebody to come towards us if they are there. Then, we hear the exact same scream behind us, exactly from where we came from. We get about halfway back to the house, and the scream comes so loudly it seems to be right next to us. We frantically shine our flashlights everywhere and find nothing. No eye glints of animals, no rustling of bushes, just silence. We trace our steps back, and the scream comes from around the creek again. This time, it lasted about 30 seconds and was much louder than before. Our retreat becomes a little more hastened. By this time, we were both scared shitless and verified with the family to call us again if they heard it. They never called again, and we got the hell out of there. I still don't know what it was. As an avid outdoorsman, I know no animal makes a cry like that, especially one that can move stealthily without being spotted by flashlights. Something else that weirded me out was that it was completely silent while the screams were happening. During summer in Wyoming, 
there is always some type of ambient animal sound. Frogs croaking, crickets chirping, owls hooting, coyotes howling, etc. But there was nothing. Until we were leaving and the screams had stopped. Then a frog started croaking. It gives me the creeps just thinking about it still. Back when I was working as a cop on a military base, I loved working the night shift. I didn't deal with 99% of the BS that day shift dealt with and what little stuff we did deal with was usually really interesting. Well, most every building on a base is alarmed, and the alarms are tied right into the desk, so we know the instant they go off. When we get an alarm activation, we close the base and go check the building. We pull on all the doors to see if we can get in. If we can, we go into the building and secure it, checking all the doors and corners to see if someone set the alarm off. Well, one night I was on patrol with my alpha partner, and we got called to respond to an alarm activation at the elementary school. So we go, secure the building, and call in that the building is all secure. No problem. Keep patrolling. So about 15 to 20 minutes go by and we get another alarm activation. We get back out there and check, and now there is a maintenance door open that leads into a boiler roomish thing. Nothing in it, so we close it, lock it, and get out. Another 20 minutes, and another alarm. We respond, all the doors are still locked and we can't get in. The maintenance door is locked. Call it the all clear. This time, my buddy and I sit on opposite sides of the school and watch to see if someone is coming and yanking the doors really hard to set the alarm off. We sit there and watch. Nothing happens, and right as we're about to leave, another alarm goes off. We inform the desk that we'd like the building manager on site to help us secure the interior and let us in. This is now like 3 a.m. The building custodian shows up and we start doing a walkthrough, checking all the classrooms and all the maintenance rooms, and that's when we see one of the maintenance doors open with the lights on in the room. Now, this room is literally the size of a closet. We walk down there and look in. No one is in it and that door is locked when it closes. We looked inside and discovered a single footprint of a small child's bare foot made of water, left foot, to be specific, the living hell out of us because no one reported a missing child and the entire building was clear and still locked up. We checked every inch of that damn place, literally a three hour deep sweep, including ceiling tiles, and no one left or entered dot the ever loving crap out of us. And to this day, my partner refuses to go into that school. Speaking of which, schools are really spooky when they're empty. A police officer is present. One evening about eight years ago, it was pouring outside and we got a call from an elderly woman, seems to be a common theme in this thread. She called in and said that she was hearing footsteps in her house and she thought there was a ghost inside because she regularly heard the sound of someone walking upstairs, but she lived alone. We went just to check it out and make sure that everything was okay. She stayed on the line with the 911 operator because she was frightened. About three minutes after she initially called in, she said that there was actually a man standing outside in her backyard, staring at her through her sliding glass door. Petrified, the woman froze in that spot and continued to stare directly at the man. For the next minute or two, she said that he was just standing there, still as could be, staring at her. Eventually, the man slunk off out of sight. When we arrived, about 12 minutes after the first call came in, we went to the front door. I stayed in the foyer with the woman and the other officer while I went to the backyard to see if the man was still there or if there were any traces of him. I spoke with her for a few minutes until the other officer returned. He said there was no trace of anyone having been in the backyard. 
We set off to do a quick sweep before we left to make sure the house was all clear. In her living room, the room that has the sliding glass door, we discovered a trail of mud and footprints inside the house. I asked the woman if she had been outside at all that day or if anyone had been over to visit her. She said no, that she lived alone, and that no one had come by to visit. The woman was very old, probably around 85, and had very poor eyesight and was hard of hearing, as elderly people tend to be. The woman obviously saw the man's reflection and mistakenly thought he was in front of her, on the other side of the glass, in her backyard. In reality, he had been standing only a few feet behind her in the same room while she had been talking to 911. Nothing was stolen, broken, or out of place, so we don't know what his intentions were. Who knows what would have happened had she not stayed on the line with the operator. I know it sounds like something out of a campfire story, but it was honestly one of the most unnerving and creepy experiences I have had while on duty. My grandpa was a police officer back in the day. He worked on murder cases and did detective work in his later career. But this late night, he was responding to a call of suspected shots fired at an old abandoned house. My grandpa tells the story something like this. He and his partner were the closest to the house of everyone who received the dispatch call, so they made it there first. When they reached the house, they found the gate through the backyard forced open, so they followed through. They had fired, so they had their weapons drawn. As they approached the house, there was one unarmed man attempting to enter the house, which was locked. The man fled while my grandfather's partner chased after him. Here's the creepy part. My grandpa looked through the window of the house, thinking that maybe that guy was trying to get to someone on the inside. When he looks in, he vaguely sees someone standing and looking directly at him. My grandpa raises his pistol and says, Police, don't move. Simultaneously, the man inside appeared to also raise his pistol. My grandpa says, Now, I have never had someone draw his weapon on me. And I began to think, what if I don't shoot before he does? And the adrenaline was pumping. So, he says, drop the weapon or I'll be forced to shoot. The man stays still ridiculously still. My grandpa takes cover on the right side of the window and radios in for his partner, who has lost the man on foot. Before his partner returned, he popped back out from the right to try to advance, expecting the man to have gone away and found a place to hide. So, with his weapon drawn, he jumps out and looks inside. But when he looks into the window with his weapon drawn, there he is, still hazy and dark, and pointing his weapon directly at him. It's silent for what seems like forever. My grandpa shouts again, drop the weapon and get down on the ground. With adrenaline pumping, my grandpa says that at this point he began to believe it was a ghost because of how still it was. Then, he sees that the assailant is wearing a badge. This freaked me out, he said. Had my partner made it inside and was playing with me? Was this man impersonating an officer? Once more, he said, drop your weapon and get on the ground. And motioned with his pistol. The ghost man also motioned with his pistol. And at this point in the story, my grandpa says it best. It was a cotton picking mirror. I got myself worked up over my own damn reflection. And that's the story of how my grandpa almost crapped himself over his own reflection. I'm a Florida police officer. I had an older lady call and say she was trapped in her house. When I arrived, I observed a white powder poured out in a half circle in front of her door. I knocked. She spoke through a nearby window. She explained that a voodoo priest had put a hex on her and trapped her in the house. She claimed that if she crossed over the powder, her back would break. I told her to sit on her couch and wait. 
I would be back soon. I went to a store where I knew the clerk. I borrowed a bucket and a broom. Returning to the lady's house, I filled the bucket from a garden hose. While saying the Lord's Prayer loud enough for her to hear inside, she swept and rinsed the powder away. I then told her it was safe. She opened the door and asked what I had done. I told her I had gone to a church for holy water and had a priest bless the broom. She was so happy, she hugged me for a long time. I got the name and location of the voodoo priest from her. I was able to find him later in my shift. I got in his face and told him if he bothered that lady again I'd kick his ass and take him to jail. We will not allow harassment, scamming, or preying on the elderly. My dad spent his whole career as a copper, and is the stereotypical straightforward bloke with it who has little time for anything you might label as paranormal. That said, he describes one event from about 20 years ago that he can't explain. One late afternoon in autumn, he was patrolling with a colleague in Newbury, Berkshire, UK, when they were radioed and asked to check out reports of a fight on the rural outskirts of town. Apparently, sounds of an altercation had been heard coming from a field, of all places, and locals were concerned, but hadn't been able to describe or give any more info. When they got to the field in question, my dad and his colleague hopped the fence and headed inwards, not immediately seeing or hearing anything. It was gloomy and a little misty at ground level, but apparently just about enough light was left in the day to see that there wasn't obviously anyone about. Apparently, they gave the field a sweep and were on their way back to the car when, as my dad describes it, suddenly all went mental. Shouting, screaming, and the sounds of an almighty fight completely surrounded him, even though he was standing in a field completely empty apart from his colleague. He says three things in particular stick with him. First, he wasn't scared shitless at the time, though he might say that. Second, the look on his colleagues' faces that basically said WTF, you're hearing this too, right? And finally, the sounds just stopped and they made their way back to the car and called in to say nothing was wrong. When pushed, he admits it felt like he was in the middle of something significant, and that he thinks he felt, not just heard, the fighting around him, and that, with hindsight, he was more frightened after the event than at the time. He would never describe this as paranormal himself, but to me this always sounded like a replay type event people talk about, and subsequently learning about the civil war history of the specific area in question backs this up, for me at least. I've not heard of other accounts of similar stories from the area, but I haven't looked that hard to be honest. My grandmother was a cop in Santa Maria in the late 70s and early 90s. A man calls in saying there is a 7-foot gray man at his door. She goes to check it out. The door is jammed. The man is screaming, and she hears a loud buzzard. She slams the door open and the buzz is gone, and so is the man. There's blood everywhere. She calls for backup and runs around and calls his name. She hears what sounds like someone yelling, but someone is covering their mouth. She finds him tied up with piss everywhere. Investigators say that he was in that room for at least four hours. A man lives alone in the middle of nowhere. He says he called the police five hours ago. Said that a cop was on their way. He reported seeing a seven-foot gray man with big eyes who did that to him. No footprints no trace of any kind of invasion. My grandmother lost four hours somehow. The guy ended up killing himself a few years later, leaving a note behind, warning my grandmother that they are after him, and thanking her for rescuing him. Crazy. My dad is a police officer and he was called to an old castle-like house on the outskirts of town. 
The man who called was telling him about his daughter, who was acting strange. She was talking in a deep voice and speaking in swear words and high-level vocabularies. She was only 10 or so and being all around creepy. My dad said, "I think you need an exorcist." and left that house immediately. He's been a police officer for 12 years and he says that was the most scared he's been and he's seen people who have blown their brains out with a shotgun and people decapitated by a train. I was a 911 dispatcher for about 5 years after school. One night, I got a call from a lady at a residence in town. 911, what is your emergency? Is this the police? She breathed. She was freaking out. Heavy breathing, trembling voice Eve taken many calls like this, and from the sound of her voice, this was not going to be a routine call. I sat up straight and my heart started to pump faster. Yes, mom, what is your emergency? There's someone in my house. She trailed off very breathy and genuine, but not loud and freaking out. Okay, are you located at house address? Yes. I dispatched the cars to start heading over to the address, and I don't give a reason yet. Okay, do you know who this person is? Well, No, I don't. I think it's it's I know this sounds so crazy, but I think that there's a ghost in my house. She begins to sob and sound scared. There are noises, and I know there is a ghost in the other room right now. At this time, the sergeant asks me the reason for the call and why I sent him in the other two cars without explanation. Normally, you'd send one car to something like that. It's suspicious activity, I told him. What activity? He demanded over the radio. A fair question. Sir, the caller is claiming there is someone in the house and she believes it to be a ghost. Silence on the air for about a minute. 10 to 4 is all he said. By the time they got there, the ghost was gone and the poor lady was a freaked out mess, and she kept apologizing for calling us, but it was real. she kept repeating the officers later told me that her sincerity actually freaked them out a lot and when they searched the house guns drawn even they were scared we got a call about trespassers at an abandoned hospital during the daytime there was on site security who kept it secure even though it was shut down They swore they heard footsteps and talking on the second floor over the past few days. They locked down the entire perimeter and called us out there. There was no way out. We went in there with 6 officers and started from the 7th floor and systematically checked every single room down to the bottom floor. There was no power, so we were lucky that it was still daylight and there were a lot of windows. It was an older hospital. So they left old CRT monitors from the 1980s and 90s in there. It was pretty eerie and reminded me a lot of the first scenes of The Walking Dead. We cleared down from floors 7 to 5 with no problem. Once we hit the 4th floor, things started getting weird. This was the hospital storage area. Instead of the big spacious rooms, it was super cramped with cinder block walls. There were chain link cages all over the place with old locks on them. It seriously looked like a horror movie prisoner area where they locked victims up. It was also pitch black. The hospital was so big that we worked in two man groups on each floor, but naturally split up as the floors opened up more. The third floor was a mental ward area, so the padded walls and pitch dark room started to get me a little nervous. The second floor was by far the worst. It was the surgery ward. There were no windows. Again, it was pitch black, and there were large, eerie operating rooms all over. In the middle of some of the rooms were large metal slabs where they would operate on people. In my adjoining rooms, they had huge pegboards where they stored the surgery power tools. How did I know it was power tools? 
They had marked the outlines of various drills, saws, and other painful looking devices. It was kind of freaky thinking about how many people had died in those rooms when they couldn't save them. I was definitely nervous clearing those rooms solo in pitch black with only a flashlight. We eventually cleared every single room on every single floor. And found nothing. The security guard swore up and down that they always heard talking and footsteps down the halls. We pretty much swore off that place and said not to call us anymore. When I was in high school, before cell phones were common, my friends would come over to my house one night to pick me up. We had made plans at school for them to pick me up at 7 p.m. At 6, my parents said I had to come with them to do something, and I totally forgot to call my friends and tell them. They came to my house at 7 p.m. and called the house phone. No one answered. There were four of them in the car. They all told us the exact same story. They said that they were about to pull out of my driveway, but they saw someone peeking through the blinds from the bedroom on the top floor right. That was my room, so they assumed that I was messing around. Five more times, they said that someone would peek through the blinds, and a couple of them said they even saw the person's eyes. We got home at probably 7. 10. Minus 7. 15, and they were still in our driveway. One of my friends came over and said they thought I was messing with them. Then they asked me, so, who's staying in your room? I told them that no one. So they asked, who is home at your house right now? Again, I told them, no one. Their stone cold faces then told me what they had seen repeatedly over the last 15 minutes. At first, we all thought there was a burglar in the house or something, so we called the cops. They came over and inspected the house. There were no signs of a break-in, nothing had been touched or stolen. Our house had an alarm on it, so there is no way someone could have come into the house without setting off the alarm. My family, my friends, and the cop all kind of stood around for a few minutes trying to make sense of the situation. My friends swore up and down, and still do, that they couldn't have imagined what they saw. All four of them saw the same things, and it wasn't particularly a dark night, so their eyes wouldn't be playing tricks on them. To this day, none of us can make sense of the situation. One of the nice things about working in small towns is the unique problems that you learn to solve. One such problem belonged to a sweet little old lady who lived in a big old mansion over in the old section of town. She had a, ahem, ghost infestation. Most of the time, this was alright, I think she liked the company, but once in a while the ghosts would get a wee bit rowdy. Thereupon, she'd call the S.O and one of us would be dispatched to take care of the situation. We'd show up, she'd let us into the huge old house, and the officer would go upstairs and read a stern warning to the ghosts. I found that if you took George C. Scott's speech from Patton, complete with pacing back and forth and gestures, and cleaned up the language a bit, the ghosts would normally be impressed enough to keep quiet for a week or two. Once you were done, You'd go back downstairs, where the lady would stuff you full of homemade cinnamon rolls and iced tea, and you'd swap gossip for a while. One day, the sheriff gets a bright idea. We'd take care of this situation once and for all. Plans are made. People are notified. We waited for the call. And on a Friday evening, she calls. Not only are the ghosts rowdy, it sounds like they're having a party. And, delivered in whispered tones, she thinks she heard some girl ghosts giggling up there, and this wasn't right. The call goes out. We load up our full-time officers, all four of them. We get our reserves, mostly security from a local federal facility. We don our ninja gear. We mount our trusty steed, reworked, Korea-era ambulance, 
and we sway and sputter and backfire and shudder and creak our way over hill and through dale. Once on location, a hasty whispered conference takes place. Who looks the least threatening? That would be yours. I truly had hysterics in the back. I go up, I knock on the door, I tell the little old lady that we're here to solve her problem and seat her on the porch swing with a blanket. Crash. 20 SWAT rhinos in full gear hit the door, clear the bottom floor tactically, flow down the stairs, and then the shouting starts. Hey you. Yes you. Out. One here. Out, out. Clear. Where do you think you're going? Out. Thus were our thoroughly scared and cowed, albeit invisible, subjects herded to the front lawn, where the sheriff was standing on the roof of the ambulance, excuse me, SWAT vehicle, delivering his patented fire and brimstone, straight path slash crooked path speech. Complete with finger pointing, arm waving, and emotional entreaties to what only an absolute cynic would consider an empty lawn. All of the neighbors, heck, most of the town, watched with bated breath, and promptly got out the lawn chairs, sodas, and snacks, effectively starting a block party small towns. Once we were done, and had allowed the thoroughly chastised and completely humbled spirits back upstairs, we sat in her kitchen, in black BDUs, rifles, shotguns, etc., eating cinnamon rolls and drinking iced tea. During this last part, the lady whispered to me that we had missed one. I never said I wasn't fast on my mental feet, I promptly whispered back that he was too young to be subjected to such a scary action. She examined him closely and declared that I was probably right. It took the ghosts almost three months to go back to their rowdy ways. My husband and I went to a state fair, and someone stole my battery out of my car, a 67 Valiant. The security were off-duty cops, and one worked part-time at a parts store. So they were pretty cool and took us to get a new battery after hours. On the way there, they told us the story of a lady who would call about aliens in her yard. They were laughing about how they tied a knot in her fridge cord and told her the way the currency crossed. An alarm would sound if any aliens came within 100 yards of her house. Said they never heard from her again. I wonder to this day whether or not the aliens got her since she was lured into a false sense of security. This is from a friend who used to work as a security guard. My friend is a night person, so he's used to night shifts. Well, anyways, one night he's working to guard a mansion, and at 2. 22 a door access alarm goes off from the gym room. By usual protocol, he calls 911 and has the cops deal with it. The cops, two of them, meet with my friend and head to the gym room. A short while later, the cops start yelling at my friend how prank calls are a serious offense and he shouldn't waste their time. My friend, flabbergasted by the cops' reaction, asks what's wrong, and one of the cops says that an old lady told them that she had been in the house for a long time. My friend does not understand what lady they're talking about since there's no one in that mansion. The owners left on a cruise for a month or so. They stopped to stare at each other in silence and head inside the mansion. My friend swears to me it's true. They go inside, and right in the entry hall, you can see the painting of the old lady. The cop turns white and leaves. My friend, confused by what happened, just noped out of there the moment he finished his shift. Apparently, that was the painting of the current owner's great-grandmother. I was doing security at a hospital with an ER, ICU, surgical suite, the whole works, and I got called to several paranormal calls. 
Most were psych cases or paranoid people that heard a strange noise. This time, more than one nurse saw a guy on the camera who was on his deathbed, a guy who kept saying I will not die in a hospital earlier that day, literally push his curtain aside and walk out of his room toward the elevator. A code was called and everyone immediately posted at their designated locations. Within seconds, there were people watching the elevators and stairs, and security started combing the area and investigating. As I reached the ICU floor, I spoke with the lead nurse, and she told me several of the nurses saw him leave. At that moment, monitors started going off. The guy never left. The guy went code blue and died right then. There were three witnesses on the report that said he got up and left and were serious enough to call a code, which could have cost them their jobs if they were wrong. The bosses wouldn't let us watch the video, but the looks on their faces said it all. The bosses said the nurses did the right thing, and some things just can't be explained. The portion of the video I was allowed to see did show that nobody had left via elevator or stairs. Not a cop, but during a ride-along we were dispatched to this house for a domestic disturbance. We entered the house and found an elderly couple sitting on the couch. The woman immediately began to tell us that her husband had been walking through walls and bringing girls back to their house and fornicating, her words, on the kitchen floor. Clearly the woman was nuts, and her husband just sat there staring at us. I swear if he had cracked a smile, I would have lost it completely. The woman ended up being committed, and the man probably quit walking through the walls with his girls and instead uses the door now. A Navy Security Forces member here this will probably get buried, but oh well. I was on shift with a DOD police officer on the oldest Navy base we have in the States. We get a call about an alarm going off in a nearby office and it being midnight. We quickly get over there. When we get to the building, there are lights on in the second story. We try all the doors and they are locked. We try the windows locked. We look for any possible entryway and everything is sealed up tight. We called the building commander, and they sent a guy to come and turn off the alarm and let us look around to make sure all is well. When he got there, his first statement to us was, alarm going off again. Damn it, I'm sick of that ghost messing with my days off. Apparently, Everyone that works in that building has claimed there is a ghost that likes to move stuff around and cause the alarm to go off, and a check of the call log for the alarm activation showed that every time it went off, the building was locked up tight. I work for a manufacturing company and we used to work in an old building. I had heard many stories of weird things going on during the night shift but never thought much of it. It was a very creepy place, but I worked during the day and there was never a problem. Well, seven months ago we moved to a new location, for cheaper leasing, and we worked long days moving everything out. I drove our five ton while my manager helped load and unload. It was 8 PM. On our last product delivery trip, and it was completely dark. There was no one else around except us two. The building is set up with an advanced alarm system. Every exit door is listed on a screen, and all doors beep loudly when opened. Now I start loading the last skids with the power jack at our receiving end while my boss uses our forklift to move product from a couple warehouse rooms over. When she drops off the skid and gets ready to wrap it, we hear the door beep. We looked at each other, wondering if it was our imaginations. We had been working for 13 hours, so it was a possibility, but she had a loud imagination. We had already seen three of the doors while there, so we knew they were secure, but decided to check out the electrical room's outer door since it's the only one we didn't pass by. We take a look, and sure enough, it's unlocked. 
The maintenance crew had been working in there during the day, and it's reasonable to assume they left it unlocked. But on the first trip back into the warehouse, all the lights on the far side, which are often unused, are all on. At that point, I started going nuts. I'm not one to believe in ghosts, but what if someone was in there? Well, we will just go about it as usual so we can get out of there. On the fourth day, she comes back and says all the lights are off again. And this is a wide open warehouse. All the racking was already down and moved, so there weren't many places to hide. As we powered through, just wanting to get the F out of there, the lights had all turned on again, but we kept going. The door goes off once more but we already check them and know they are all locked. The tenth skids in and the power jack randomly dies. That thing can last a week, but that I used a regular jack and got the rest loaded in. Now all we have to do is shut off all the lights and get the F out of here. Well, we go around together shutting everything off. Then as we get to the outer door to set the alarm, we can't because the alarm system says half the doors are open. Damn it, we're leaving, my boss said. And she would never ever leave the building without arming it. So I was very surprised, and as we drove out and around, we saw half the lights were on in the warehouse and a few in the office parts. We moved because we hadn't used the offices in years and it was expensive for leasing payments. That was the last time I set foot in that place, and after that I was really glad I never had to. And as it turns out, the weekend after that happened, the security company called my boss at night saying the alarm was going off. We had lost possession of it two days ago, so she said it's not her problem and to call the owner. I had never experienced something like this before and hope I never have to again. I was about 5 years old when my parents moved us out into this trailer on about 2 or 3 acres of land. My room was at the far end of the house next to my sister and was only about 20 yards away from the forest. Anyway, on a few nights I kept hearing a scratching sound, almost like nails on a chalkboard, so I woke up my dad, and he came in and verified that I was batshit crazy and went back to bed. This went on for about two or three weeks until one night I was listening to the scratching when it suddenly stopped and my toy chest started moving away from the wall. I ran down the hall and got my dad, and he reluctantly came to my room to check it out. When he flipped on the light, he saw a woman's head, looking like a crazy Gene Wilder, sticking through my wall where my toy chest used to be. She screamed at the top of her lungs, not like she was scared but like she was trying to scare him, and proceeded to pull at the trailer wall and try to crawl through the hole. He locked the door and called 911. The cops came out and arrested the woman who was stuck halfway in the wall and bleeding all over the place. She had apparently escaped from a mental facility four miles away and had decided to burrow into the house at night. I had just turned 22, and my parents had sold their house and purchased a place out in the country. On the property, there was a big shed not far from the house that I decided to turn into my place. Now I felt kind of uncomfortable in the shed sometimes, but my dog kept me company, so it wasn't so bad. Anyway, I had been in there maybe two weeks and one night I'm on the computer, my dog asleep at my feet, and I need to pee so I get up and go outside to piss. It's a beautiful clear night and the stars are incredible. Next thing I hear the shed door slam behind me. I turn immediately and try to open it, but it won't budge. Now from inside the shed, I can hear my dog start to growl, quietly at first, then louder. Now he's barking and I'm panicking trying to get the door open. I must mention that I'm 6 foot 5 and well built, play sports etc, but even ramming my full weight into the door won't open it and I'm really panicking now as my dog's barks turn into whines, then whimpering, 
Then silence and with all my might I slam into the door and it flies open. The light is off inside now and it's pitch black. It won't turn back on and I'm in complete darkness. I can't see my dog anywhere and I stumble around trying to find a torch. Finally, I find it and pick it up and turn on my flashlight, but I wasn't prepared for what I'd see next. My dog had literally squashed itself into the furthest, darkest corner of the room, eyes closed, and was shaking violently. I immediately moved towards him, and as soon as I got within reach of him, he leapt at me into my arms and wouldn't move. I picked him up and I swear I've never run so fast in my goddamn life. I never stepped foot in that shed ever again, and my dog wouldn't even go near that part of the property. I don't know what happened in that shed that night, but I'll never forget it. I avoid sheds now. I'm not a cop, but my story is somewhat relevant. I recently started working as a security guard, and one of my first assignments was the graveyard shift at a new housing development outside of town. Over the course of the three nights I worked there, I had some pretty bizarre things happen. While doing my patrols through the neighborhood, I would often see people watching me from the upper windows of the vacant houses, but when I entered the house to investigate, they would be empty. One of the first things on my to-do list when I arrived on site was to go through the eight model homes next to the real estate office and turn off all the lights and TVs. The first night, this part went smoothly, but the following night, as I was making my way through the kitchen of the fourth house, I heard the light switch click, and all the lights in the kitchen went out. It wasn't a power surge or a blown breaker, as all the appliances were still on and all the little green lights underneath the light switches were still lit. A few minutes later, I heard another click, and the lights came back on, followed by the lights in the next house going out, but the TV remaining on. By the time I made my way to the next house, the lights were back on, but the TV was on standby, only possible by hitting the button on the front. As I was finishing up in the last house, I looked out the window and saw that the second and third houses were lit up again. On the third night, the light situation got weirder. The lights would either turn off or on in a room as I entered, and in one house, as I entered the kitchen, the hood light over the stove turned on. As I turned to look at it, I heard a series of clicks coming from the second floor, as if someone were running through the house turning on the lights. When I went up there, sure enough, many of the lights I had turned off were back on. In another house, a desk lamp turned itself back on three times. Another lamp in the same house that had a dimmer slowly started lighting up right in front of me. Now, for the worst events, as I was walking past one of the construction sites, I saw what appeared to be a skunk walking behind the porta potty. When it walked back out, however, it looked more like a black shih tzu. It proceeded to change size, shape, and color several more times right in front of me, Doberman, Bloodhound, Tan Mastiff, and finally a yellow lab, before running off into the dark. I'm willing to concede all of these can either be chalked up to my mind slash eyes playing tricks or a timer gone haywire, I was assured there wasn't one, but this last one defies logical explanation. As I was walking back to the office around 2. 30, I glanced up at one of the houses. As I did, something hit me in between my left peck and shoulder. Hard. Hard enough to stagger me. I weigh 250 pounds, so I'm not exactly small. It felt as if someone was walking in the opposite direction on the sidewalk and shoved their way past me. I have since asked my supervisors not to assign me to that site again. First off, I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, in any way, shape, or form. That said, I had a few very strange experiences working at the hospital. 
I have tons of stories about working at the hospital, but I'll post one of the strangest. If you want to hear more, let me know. I have dozens. The hospital was made up of several buildings, mostly from the mid 20th century. There was a large seven story building with offices and accommodation for student nurses, Simpson Hall, a large central administration building with eight wings for patients and a forensic, criminally insane, unit, pretty building, a new building under construction to replace the old Victorian building, Mount Hope, a building with a gym, kitchen, dining room and swimming pool, Hugh Bell building, two small outlying buildings for children and adolescents, POW and MCU, and then the old insane asylum, DeWolf building, built in 1856, 20 ceilings, 200 pounds oak and steel doors, 18 to 24 thick walls, underground tunnels, everything you've ever thought an old Victorian insane asylum would be. When I first started working there, in 1992, my job was to go from the guard post in the Hugh Bell building, down into the basement, unlock the steel doors leading to the tunnel system, lock myself into the tunnel system, walk along to the DeWolf building, go through another set of steel gates, lock myself inside, walk the tunnel system to the end, and then go up in an elevator I called down using a special key. Then I'd go up to the fourth floor and walk through each floor, checking doors until I got to the main floor, where I'd walk out of the main entrance and back to the Hugh Bell building outside. I had to do this roughly every hour. In 1995, the building closed and patients were moved into the new Mount Hope building. Because the space was no longer being used and because the building was slated to be demolished in 1996, they didn't bother heating it. It had no power and maintenance had been through and stripped it of things like light bulbs, etc. A lot of the old furniture was left in place as they had bought new furniture for the new building. One of the things that also happened was that they shut off power to the elevators and had all the phones removed. Now I know that every phone was removed because I was the guy who went through with the guy from the phone company in late summer and removed every single phone from the place. So it's the winter of 1995 and I'm working a back shift, 7 p.m., 7 a.m. I was a shift supervisor and had three guards on the ground with me and one locked in the forensic unit. At around 2 a.m., we got a call from the hospital operator saying that the police had called her to let her know they were getting calls from inside the DeWolf building. She had, of course, told them that was impossible and why not. They insisted that they were getting calls from inside the DeWolf building. So the four of us go into the building and each take a floor of the building and search it. Now it was the dead of winter and temperatures had been getting fairly low, 20 C or so, and there had been a pipe burst about a week before which maintenance had dealt with, interesting story there, too, but it had left two floors entirely coated in ice there was ice on everything that was about three inches thick and shadows were bouncing everywhere from the flashlights hitting ice. So we're walking through the building, checking every unit, every floor, eyeballing every empty phone jack. Nothing. We get back to the guard post and report that the building is empty. Ten minutes later, the operator calls back and says that there are more calls coming from DeWolf and the police are insisting we find the cause. So, back over we go. I was about 10 away from the nursing station on a unit called N16, and the operator called to say that there was a call active right now coming from the N16 nursing station. I go rushing over to see and there's nothing in there. No person, no phone. I tell the operator where I am and there's nothing in there. She says that it's now coming from the N16 lounge, which is way down at the other end of the unit. So I go rushing down there and, again, nothing. Now it's coming from the N16 elevator phone, and this time it's not just dead air, but it sounds like someone talking with their hand over the phone. So I go rushing back down to the other end of the unit, this is a good 60 seconds or so of running big building, 
and I'm standing outside the closed, unpowered, elevator doors and she is saying that the calls are coming in every few seconds from the elevator I'm standing in front of. Then they stop. We all decide to wait inside the building, one person per floor, for a few minutes until we know things have stopped. We waited maybe 15 minutes, and as we started to leave, the phone call started again. One more trip around the building and the same results. Eventually, we said we couldn't waste any more time on it and it must be a technical glitch. The operator puts in a call to the phone company and requests an engineer first thing the next morning. I was supposed to go home at 7 a.m., my last back shift, so I was starting four days off, but I stayed to meet the engineer because I was curious. The engineer said the lines had likely been reassigned and the calls were coming from real people wherever the lines had been put. So we go into the old building and check the junction box, and the engineer gets a puzzled look on his face. He hooks up some equipment and is talking back to someone at the phone company. He starts checking connections and numbers. Then we started walking around the building and plugging his phone into the jacks. It turned out that none of the lines had been reassigned and they were all live. Here's the strange part. That day, the engineer and the phone company killed all the lines. The phone calls continued off and on for two more weeks, and then stopped. We never did find out the cause. Not a cop, but had to respond to the call as an EMT. I'll start with the fact that this was up in the mountains, 8,000 feet altitude. This guy calls 911 and claims there is a snake in his hotel room, so we go to check it out with the fire crew. We show up to a guy freaking out saying there is a python loose in his room. Well after a few questions, he claims there is a piranha trying to escape from the python's mouth, but the spirits in the python's brain are telling the python that it can't let the piranha go. Okay, now we know something is wrong with this guy. We walk in the room to find a rolled up towel sticking out of the bathroom door door. The man had claimed he had trapped the python in the door and he was trying to let the piranha escape. We found acid and heroin inside of the rolled up towel. Dude was having a great time until the towel stole his drugs. More drug induced than paranormal, but the dude thought his towel was possessed. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.